Oh. <clears throat> My, I often comment that in the PMR town halls at, at one o'clock, we'll have five people and at 101 we'll have 105 so we'll give it another second <laughs> that's good church service practice come late and miss all the announcements <laughs> yeah exactly and then complain that you don't know anything <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. I want both ways. <laughs> hi Marion how are you I'm muted now. I'm just fine, thanks. thanks. Yeah, all settled in my new place, and it's wonderful. Oh, that's fabulous. That's Marion Best for those of you who don't know. Where's your new place, Marion? I'm right next door to Naramata Center. Oh, <laughs> um, it's a, it's a four unit uh, place that was built for seniors. And uh, I was very fortunate that the only two bedroom unit came available just as I was ready to move. So it's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, Marion. You were um, with the moderators when um, the ladies from um, Alberta were the wild roses at Naramata. We were yes. kind of the welcoming committee. Yeah. I've still got the photograph from that. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Well, I think we should probably just go ahead and get started and and uh, let folks uh, trickle in as they as they wish. So first of all, I just want to welcome everybody to this. I think this is our first joint town hall between the two regions and uh, just seems like a, a great opportunity to share resources and have us come together. So we're having this one and then on May 5th, we're gonna have a second joint town hall to focus in on um, Red Dress Day. So we'll look forward to seeing you all there for that one as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Pam Rocker. Pam is leading the affirm process in both regions. And so um, she's going to be the one that's kind of coordinating our time together today. So thanks, Pam, for that work. And thanks to all of you for participating in these affirming ministry conversations and um, look forward to our time together with uh, Gary Patterson today. Thanks so much, Trina. What a, an amazing turnout that we have for this Wednesday afternoon. So appreciative of you folks for joining in on this important conversation with a very special guest. Um, as Trina shared, both regions, Pacific Mountain and Chinook Winds are going through the affirming process to discern about becoming an affirming region. And this is one part of our programming. We've had the Queer Virtue series during Lent. And also we had an evening with Austin Hartke uh, who talked about trans theology and gender diverse folks and gender and sexually diverse folks in the Bible. And now we have this amazing afternoon with Gary Patterson. So um, I also want to invite those who are on the Chinook Winds or the Pacific Mountain affirming working groups to maybe add that to your title. Um, add, you know, just a little bit next to your name and rename yourself. That way folks can see who you are and if they have any questions about the process or something that they would want to see or anything like that, that they can contact you. We have two really robust teams who are working really hard to make this a meaningful and thoughtful process. And uh, they are a, a huge gift for me to be able to work alongside. So if you can name yourself, that would be great. Um, we have the chance to hear from someone who I know in my history with the United Church, which seems like forever, but for a lot of you, I'll seem like a baby in many ways, but since about 2010. Um, and when I, I realized that there was an openly gay person who was elected to be moderator, like it just blew my mind. And um, I never want to lose that sense of um, the sense of gratitude to be a part of a denomination that although we are not perfect and obviously we're striving to do more, that in many ways um, we continue to strive and try and know that we're never going to arrive and similarly to an affirming journey we will continue and I just remember how like much that meant to me coming from a evangelical Baptist church in Texas to being a part of a denomination where <laughs> there was an openly gay person 
in this really sacred role. And so it's doubly special for me to get to introduce Gary as part of my continued journey of you know, exploring what it means to be affirming. So whether you have been with the United Church for a long time, or maybe this is something that's actually new for you, or you, you know, are just beginning to be part of these conversations, that's totally okay. So I'm going to share a little bit more about Gary, even though he might be shy, because I want to make sure that you can be in on what some of us are already. So uh, the very Reverend Gary Patterson has been in ordained ministry for 44 years, serving in many settings from a small country church to small, medium, and large city churches with BC conference staff responsible for congregational support ministry and youth and young adult ministry as a congregational minister at First United and Vancouver's downtown east side as lead minister in Vancouver's downtown, downtown cathedral-esque church, it's so beautiful, St. And Andrew's Wesley and as moderator from 2012 to 2015. This June, he will finally be retiring. I'm not sure why, it doesn't sound like he's done very much and is dreaming about what can next. Uh, Gary is an openly gay minister. He's been part of a firm United Saframe Ensemble since it began in 1982, consequently the, the year I was born. <laughs> he was a commissioner at General Council in 1988, where the United Church struggled with the issue and discerned that God welcomed LGBTQ people as full members of the church. So we are very pleased to welcome Gary to talk about having a place at the table and I want to share in the chat, if you allow me, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Gary, that you love that term, a place at the table. It's from Shirley Marie's hymn called A Place at the Table. And I think you'll um, love to be reminded of the lyrics for those folks who aren't familiar with it. And so I'm gonna put that into the chat. But without further ado, please welcome Gary to this afternoon with us. Well, friends, it is absolutely delightful to be with you. And I'm so glad that this is a, a joint regional meeting. So that uh, people that I know and uh, recognize from uh, Vancouver and from BC and from the mountains are joining with the Chinook. And I, I put a claim into Chinook. I have a daughter and two grandchildren in Calgary. And so we are often there uh, pre-COVID times and are missing them deeply, but keep in touch with what's happening in Calgary and therefore in the Chinook region somewhat. This has been a, an interesting experience to prepare for this talk because it meant that I had to go over a lot of history. And Pam, you do feel a little bit like a, a baby. It, it, I'm, I'm both, what, feeling like an elder and feeling overwhelmed to think that you were just born in 1982 and that uh, in 1982, I was beginning to lead workshops as a straight person at that point in the 80, early 80s um, for Made in God's Image and being in church basements and, uh, and you were just a, a spark and a beginning. And I, I look with fondness with Marion, who's still on my screen when we moved to uh, the speaker for all the times that we have shared and for her gift of chairing the sessional committee in 1988. And I'll be talking a bit about that later but it is good to be here. And so let me just launch in and take you back just three or four or five years, um, Trump times, which we're trying to forget, but there was a classic, absolutely United Church sign outside of the church on their big bulletin board that said, and I, I've added, I think that they, they wanted, but were a little bit too careful, but Jesus said, um, do not build a taller wall, just build a longer table. And that felt like classic United Church theology and affirmation in the midst of what was then a, a refugee crisis, but points to the larger meaning of the term affirmation. Which brings me to the song by Shirley Arena Murray, one of my favorite hymn writers. She's passed away from New Zealand. But if you're looking for a collection of interesting language, she's the person that wrote uh, God Weeps in More Voices or God of the Gospel, God of the Bible, number 28, a congregational favorite of ours. But she writes, for everyone born, a place at the table. For everyone born, clean water and bread, a shelter a space, a safe place for growing, for everyone born, a star overhead. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. And God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. For trans woman, man, there's a place at the 
table, revising the roles, deciding to share with wisdom and grace, sharing the power for trans and man woman, a system that's fair for young and for old, a place at the table, a voice to be heard a part of the song, the hands of a child in hands that are wrinkled for young and for old, the right to belong for gay and for straight, for LGBTQ2S and straight, there's a place at the table, a covenant shared, a welcoming space. Now, now get this image, it's quite beautiful. A rainbow of race and color and gender for LGBTQ and straight, a chalice of grace. For everyone born, a place at the table, to live without fear and simply to be, to work, to speak out, to witness, to worship, for everyone born the right to be free. And God will delight when we are creators of justice and joy, compassion and peace. And God will delight when we are creators of justice, justice and joy. It's one of the very few hymns that I have come across that are what mainstream that actually include the LGBT community. And I, I must confess it's added at the bottom as an additional verse to be used when needed. And you'll find some versions of the hymn that don't actually include that verse, which says a lot about our church history, but that's why we're here. I'm a gay person. And this is a discussion on affirming ministries, which always begin with the place and the welcome and the celebration of the LGBTQIA2S community. We keep adding um, more and more to that. It's not in a hymn book. Um, you'd have to Google it and it's online. And then I think it may be covered by um, licensing. I'm not certain, but sure the Arena Murray has lots of connections with us in Canada and it's worth tracking down. It really is. Um, but I start with the gay and lesbian and bi and trans community, but recognize that the affirming process needs to include everybody. And um, did you know that Lois Wilson was our first woman to be moderator in 1980? And I had the delight of phoning her on International Women's Day to talk about the work she's now engaged in, which is fighting with many others across the church for the guaranteed livable income. She turned 94 a couple of weeks ago, and I emailed her and got a little mushy, and she said, enough, Gary, there is work for us to do. And I think, yes, we are a denomination ordained in 36, first uh, a woman in 1980. Marion was the second lay woman to be chosen as our moderator after Ann Squires in the 80s, so that we have wrestled with the inclusion, the affirmation of women. In 2012, we declared ourselves to be at best or hopefully an intercultural church, recognizing not just multicultural, but that we will be changed by our connections with each other. In 2015, we accepted the theology report on disabilities and said, there's got to be a place at the table for people who are disabled in one way or another. And then at the end of 2018, when we had so many people of color and indigenous people and black people, the BIPOC community come forward and say, we experienced so much racism in the United Church and you white people with so much privilege are often blind. And so we've committed ourselves to do our best to become an anti-racist church. So, this is affirmation and affirming ministries, LGBT focused, but in much broader and the learnings can be transferred from one community to another that we seek to in fact be a rainbow of race and color and gender and orientation and ability, disability, you name it. And that's the dream I think of the kingdom of God. Now, I was asked to do some theological reflection in a sort of general way. And I'm not a great systematic theologian. I mean, I can get into it and go from topic A to B, but it tends on a topic like this to be more episodic and reflective. And by gosh, it, it, it's gotta be personal. As Pam said, I'm gay. Um, I was ordained as a mixed up gay guy, happily married, but struggling. Um, 
that marriage was a gift and a blessing. I sometimes say, I don't believe in an interventionist God, but God looked at me and said, Gary, I think you are destined to be a minister, but your dad's an army sergeant and your mom is a farmer, farming background. So you could be a real conservative SOB. So I better make you gay so you won't actually fit in and you'll always be struggling with what does that mean but you're clearly destined to be a dad so i'm going to confuse you introduce you to an amazing woman and you're going to have some time together and some kids and then you're going to get on with the other part of your life which is sort of what happened and i don't believe in that kind of god but what the heck i have now partnered with tim stevenson for over almost 40 years now and we've helped raise with my former wife and her partner three incredible daughters and have four grandchildren and feel incredibly blessed but it means that i speak out of personal experience and i remember many times looking back at the decision of 1988 and actually said this at my final closing remarks at general council 2015 i have no idea what i would do where my life would be if the church had said in 1988 LGBT folk are not welcome. I, I can't imagine that. So I'm going to be speaking out of uh, my experiences. And so you'll, you'll hear part of my story because I firmly believe that a story is the shortest distance between two people. So let me take you back to the mid 60s. And I am a teenager, exactly in the middle there, born 1949. And I'm feeling the winds of puberty and hormones everywhere. And it's incredibly exciting until it becomes incredibly worrisome. Because over a year or two, I realized that I'm attracted to guys and I'm not attracted to women in the way my friends were expressing themselves. And I knew that this was a huge problem. So I spent a bit of time praying to God saying, fix this, please. Um, didn't happen. Not that there was any conversation that was happening much around. Those were the days of silence and uh, you never actually talked about homosexuality, but I did a little digging, drifted around the 300 section of the Dewey Decimal System in the library, couldn't actually get a book out on homosexuality, but the Kinsey Report was safe, or Variety, something that was safe, and I discovered that in the eyes of Canadian law, I was a criminal, and in fact, in 1966, when I'm a grand 18-year-old, um, Everett Clippert was sent to jail for life, indefinite sentence as a pathological sexual offender. And he appealed it all the way to the Supreme Court and he lost. And it wasn't until 1969 that Trudeau, as Minister of Justice, stepped in and said the nation has no rights or place in the bedrooms of the nation. And we got a partial legalization of some homosexual activity. It came about three weeks before my 20th birthday, and I thought, this is my present. I wrapped it up with a little bow in a rolled up piece of paper and said, so I'm not a criminal anymore. However, I was on the advisory committee for the prime minister when he was putting together the apology to the LGBT community for 2017. And that's when I recognized and realized and heard first that in 20, throughout the 70s and 80s, our government actively and persistently purged the military, the civil service and RCMP of any LGBT people. And they did it brutally through entrapment, midnight arrests, secret houses, threats of exposure. I mean, it was brutal. And it was not until 1992 that that law got changed with another stage in legalization. So not a criminal, but just uh, be very, very careful. I then thought, oh, well, I'll talk to my doctor until I did more research and realized that no, the medical profession thought LGBT people, me, sick, 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 sick. And it wasn't until 1973 that Dr. Evelyn Hooker did a new study that said a lot of gay men, it was on gay men at that point, her study, um, do show increasing signs of mental health challenges compared to their straight equivalents. But that's not because of the orientation, it's because of the way they're treated and the suppression, the repression, the criminalization, the hiddenness and all, all that internalized homophobia that made you feel sick at heart. So I'm thinking 1973, I'm sort of healthy, though some people did a segue to disability. <clears throat> the Catholic Church created intrinsically disordered, which I still don't really understand when I look at myself. What does it mean for me to be intrinsically disordered? But according to, unfortunately, Pope Francis, it means that the Catholic Church and priests cannot bless same-sex unions. And I love the guy, except he's absolutely wrong here. 
Um, and I would look, say, at many relationships that I know, including my own, and say, oh, so clearly blessed by God. You have only to look at fruits of the Spirit. And then I looked at the church. And let me tell you, homosexuality was not a common topic in the 60s. I don't think I ever heard the word in church. But I did absorb the fact that I was one goddamned sinner, and I was going to hell, and I better change. My spouse actually went to a Billy Graham crusade. He was so determined to change and, and found Jesus at one of the great Billy Graham uh, revivals. Only he said, it, it didn't work. So what was I to do? I share all of this because I want to point out how important the affirming process is. We've made amazing strides in Canada, incredible changes that were unbelievable to me back in the 60s or the 70s or even in the 80s. But nevertheless, there's still a lot of work to be done. We find ourselves working on issues of trans rights, transgender rights, gender identity. Did you know that LGBTQ teenagers are three times more likely to try and commit suicide than their straight equivalents? You don't know how much bullying goes on all the way from, oh, that's so gay, to the cruder epithets of faggot, homo, queer. Um, I have a granddaughter who's wrestling with her identity and it is not easy. So I'm saying, you think affirming isn't necessary. It, it actually is, particularly in smaller communities or remote communities. Um, and we need to keep doing this work and we need to be aware of the hidden pain and the insecurities that teens and young people still actually have to live with. I remember Tim and I in the mid late 80s before 88 being at an event at Naramata Center where we were talking about sexuality and one person said but what about the kids and the first response was to separate pedophilia from homosexuality which was still a common confusion inappropriate wrong but there and then Tim said well actually let me tell you we're doing this for the kids we invite you to look at your Sunday school and your youth groups and recognize that five to 10% of them are LGBT. And, and, and what are you doing for them? They need role models. They need to be reassured they're okay, that they are God's beloved children. And so it, I realized how important it is to lift up those, um, those words of P for public, I for intentional, and E for is just gone. Intentional. Explicit. Thank you. Explicit. I haven't even written down, but pie. We actually need that for people who are wandering, who are lost, who need that reassurance. The United Church is in a unique spot to be a home for many former Catholics or folk who come from evangelical traditions, where their sexuality is condemned, um, where they are often ostracized or shunned. We have a group called The Word is Out at St. Andrew's West, the United Church, anywhere from 15 to 30 strong. A huge number are, I would call them, refugees from churches where they were taught that they were not acceptable. We had one man, David, and he shared his story and testimony at the church. He said he knew of a friend who knew of a friend who knew of this so-called affirming church, and he crept into the back, sat in the back pews so that he could make his escape if necessary. And he heard a voice in his head, in his heart. It said, oh, David, welcome home. I've missed you. Which he heard as a word of the spirit, a word of God. And he wept through the whole service. And that's been his home for two years. We need to be affirming this work is not done. Particularly when you look at an international um, scale. I do confess, I sometimes get discouraged. 1.2 billion Catholics say intrinsically disordered. 400 million Orthodox say we don't want to have the discussion. 600 million Pentecostals say if you just pray the right way you'll probably be changed and a little conversion therapy can go well it can go a very short way and destroy souls. Many fundamentalists, conservatives, evangelicals also say no welcome. There's only a handful of denominations, United Church of Christ, ourselves, MCC, Metropolitan Community Church, Unitarian, Quakers, and a scattering here and there around the globe. So we are a handful of millions in the face of billions. So the affirming work, it needs to be done. 
Okay, you knew that. But at least I'm saying it again and again. I want us to take a step back though, because in preparing for this, before going straight to the Bible and all that it has to say, um, I found myself asking the question, why is it so difficult for us human beings to appreciate difference, to live with people who are different from us in one way or another, whether that be skin color, ethnicity, class level, orientation, gender identity. Why is it so different, difficult? Because it's so clear that God delights in diversity, absolutely delights in it, looks at creation and says, whoo, um, look at all of this. And behold, it is very, 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 very good. I've added a few varies, but that's just to make up for every day ends with, and God saw everything and said, yes, this is good. Did you know, I, I'm not a good uh, butterfly guy. I mean, I love watching them go by and I can identify a monarch or at least confuse it with similar colored species. But did you know that there are 18,000 butterfly species in existence? Yet you don't need 18,000 unless you love diversity unless evolution and urging and spirit movement and, well, variety is just excellent, but we have problems. You can actually look biblically and say, there it is, chapter four, Cain and Abel. Sure, it's sibling rivalry. I wanted to kill my brother at times, never did. He's a great guy, but I think it's a model for, here are two people, one a farmer, one a shepherd. They can't stand each other, so you solve your problems by a big bash. I don't want to learn from you. I don't want to be around from you. I don't want to be changed by you. So I found myself thinking, what is it? If I were young and I'd talk about our shadow side, since I'm religious, I actually want to use the word sin. I think one of our greatest sins is the ability and the willingness to do harm when we are faced by differences and refuse to embrace them as God does. And I found myself thinking sometimes it's a reaction of ignorance um, or just awkwardness and discomfort. Sometimes it's fear of the other. So we, we need to address that. Sometimes it's all around questions of identity. If you have to hang out with people who do it differently than you do, whether that be time scales, dating, clothing, marriage rituals, you recognize that everything that you've organized for your life isn't an absolute. It's one option among many. And you have to, therefore, feel comfortable with it, not because there are rules, laws, and regulations, or that it's all black and white, or right and wrong, and good and bad. You have to realize that there is diversity and possibility, and the invitation to change and to learn and to grow is part of what it means to be human. That gets even more tangled up when you throw in sexuality, which is so core to our being, to our identity, and to our spirituality, and to gender identity and gender roles. Like, is it a boy or is it a girl? Is the first question asked when a little kid arrives in the world. Like, that's crucial for our delineation. And, and I've met a number of people who say, I, I can't live with that kind of ambiguity. I remember being a minister from First United in the downtown east side. I was out one evening, just street ministry, hanging out. I met a guy who'd had a couple too many drinks. We started to chat. And he said, well, I may be a drunk down in Skid Row, but thank God I'm no effing fag. And I thought, God's got to have a sense of humor. I wanted to say, um, you happen to be speaking to the minister of First United, and I'm a fag. I mean, I'm a gay guy. And I thought, no, no need to push it here. Um, just recognize how we build hierarchies, we build self-esteem by thinking some are worse than us, and there is permission to look down on them, which then bolsters our sense of, of uh, self-esteem. I think our reluctance to embrace difference goes further than that, because if we are prejudiced and discriminate, we have access to power and money. And so we can watch how it is used to augment our own control from some of the worst cases of let's take the Jews and all their wealth, or let's enslave an entire uh, nation. Let's take people of color and enslave them. That's a power motive. And it's power and wealth that underlies our refusal to be affirming of the differences. It goes even deeper than that because we, we start to say, um, 
not being able to live with our differences gives us permission to start to project onto others our own dark side our own fears and insecurity often in the 80s some folks of the firm would get together and laugh and say our greatest critics the most vocal the most pointed are often people who themselves are struggling with their own orientation or sexual identity issues and that's probably not true it's a way for us to strike back but it's that notion that often we will project and we will demonize we will scapegoat and it's interesting to watch the theologian Gerard say that scapegoating and Jesus ending scapegoating is the core of what atonement is all about. But that's for another conversation. But I, I'm caught by that and, and I'm terrified by how it, it leads so easily to ethnic cleansing or to genocide, examples of which are still happening in our world. So the affirming work that we're doing, small, our congregation, our ministries, our region, LGBTQ, but it is such a bigger issue that we need to be aware of. I have a, a Jewish friend who says that his mother always advised him when he was growing up in Chicago. Chicago. She said, son, um, you keep an eye out for what they're doing to the homosexuals because you know that that is coming soon for the Jews. Like we were the easier ones to hate. The Jews were mixed up on the list. True in World War II, where in fact, uh, 50 to 100,000 homosexuals ended up in concentration camps, didn't make it out. Uh, Six million Jews is a significant and huge difference, but still there's a sense, hit the homosexuals, then go for the Jews, then go up the ladder. And uh, if you've been following any um, Margaret Atwood, then women will be mixed in the new uh, religious patriarchy that emerges. But now I, I'm, I'm just getting a, a little carried away here. But I want to say also that affirming is going to be hard work. I know you think things have changed and it's easy, but you're touching people at a deep place and asking them to celebrate difference and to grow from that. Um, you're going to find that there's real tension in scripture about this. There's a whole stream through particularly the uh, First Testament, the Old Testament Hebrew scriptures, where it is an exclusive community where Abraham and his followers and people will be a chosen people. And so you try to build barriers to maintain identity. And if you have any doubts about that, just take a look at um, Ezra 10 and 11, Nehemiah 13. When they come back from exile, they just close and kill off any of the marriages that are not ethnically acceptable. And the kids from those marriages are just sent away. Um, there is that, that whole movement, but it is in deep tension with the other thread in scripture, which is so often why I love scripture, because it's in argument with itself, which gives us space to, to move around. So you hear of Abraham being blessed, but he's a blessing for others. We hear the words from the prophet Isaiah, the Gentiles shall be, I mean, Israel shall be a light unto the Gentiles. There's this sense of this deep calling. Uh, we lift up figures like Ruth, uh, the Moabite, and oh God, did we hate Moabites in Israel, except she turned out to be the great grandmother of David, good old King David. And therefore, according to tradition, she was the great multi grandmother of Jesus, the hated Moabite, the outsider. And so there's this movement over and over in scripture to say, both and there is this strong emphasis on caring for the stranger the alien the foreigner um, all those who are oppressed and who are needing but there's this great stress on offering hospitality and and welcome i think the writer of hebrews got wonderfully carried away and said hey in offering hospitality to strangers you might be entertaining angels i mean it goes that deep to say, welcome the one who is different. Welcome the LGBTQ person, Jewess person, indigenous person, the BIPOC person, the disabled person, because you may be entertaining angels. Because our underlying theology is that each person, in fact, all our relations are, are cosmic incarnations. We are moving into being embodiments of God's spirit. And we need to recognize and honor that and recognize our task for our own sake, for the survival of the human species, for the survival of the earth, is to figure out how we're going to learn to live with difference. And so we keep working through the Bible and we say, well, look at Jesus.
no distinctions. Love your enemy, love your neighbor, love the stranger. He was just full of that, and then he embodied it. Um, I think Jesus was engaged in a nonstop affirming ministry. Oh, we have some prostitutes. Yeah, welcome him. Oh, some lepers. Yeah. Oh, a Roman centurion. Yeah, get him. Oh, a, a member of the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus. Yeah, he's welcome too. Oh, some tax collectors. Oh, some fishermen who haven't been properly educated. All oh, right, some Samaritan women, the Syrophoenician woman. He just said, come on, I'm building this big table. There's room for all of you. And I think he then says to us, go and do likewise. We have to incorporate the whole movement of Pentecost as one of our biblical landing points, where in fact the spirit infused people with the ability to speak so many different languages. It was unstoppable. And when you, when you pause for a moment and think the movement of spirit is what is pushing us to the embrace of diversity. It hit the church large and loud when they were wrestling with what is the place and the role of Gentiles into this new thing called church. So you might wanna look at Acts 10 and 11, that incredible dream that Peter had, where a sheet was laid, set down, and all kinds of animals that were clean and unclean were there, uh, according to the Holiness Code of Leviticus 18 to 20. And God's word said, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, God, I, I, I can't eat that. That's non-kosher. That would be unacceptable. And then God said, I love this, do not call profane what I'm calling sacred. And I feel the same way. I want to sometimes get feisty and say, don't you say that I'm some kind of sick, illegal, uh, homosexual. I am God's blessing and I'm, I'm, I belong here. And okay, I'm, I'm getting carried away. But it was wonderful. You can see the importance of the dream because it spills out of chapter 10, gets retold, and then retold a third time in chapter 11. And Peter actually finally says when Cornelius, uh, Gentile, Roman, says, um, I want to follow Christ and the spirit comes, Peter says, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. Which frankly sounds very much like the statement that came out of uh, membership ministry and human sexuality in 1988. Like we're just catching up on a little bit of history. And so you find that whole tension within the early church, who belongs, who's in, who's out, who do we affirm and why? And we discover how we affirm because of the presence and the grace of God's spirit. So I find myself thinking, so what will help us live with differences? And, and so, so part of it, and well, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a born teacher, so I have still some conviction that learning and growing understanding and education can be helpful. And the United Church is known for that approach. I mean, 1980 um, in God's image. Oh, people weren't so pleased with it. So let's draw up conclusions and ask them to study it in 1984, another report on sexuality. 1984, another report from MP&E on ordination. Oh, we're still upset and worried. Well, another report towards a human understanding of sexuality and ordination. No, we don't like that. So we'll do membership and I mean, we learn, we keep pushing ourselves to learn more and more and more. And, and I, I think that's quite wonderful. When I was moderator, normally when you do overseas visits, you are asked um, simply to listen and bring greetings. But when I went to Columbia, they said, will you please talk about the United Church's process of inclusion and the acceptance of LGBT people. And by the way, if you wanna bring your spouse and let him talk, we'd like that too. And so we gave this workshop that was not trying to tell people what they should or shouldn't do, but simply sharing our story. And one woman at the end said, hey, Bishop, you're gonna to have to do some new Bible teaching here because you taught us that the Bible says this is no good. And now here's another minister, another Bishop, saying it is so we need to learn a little more help us help us bishop like education is important also i've learned i'm, I'm sometimes a hasty person but patience and time and persistence in the beginning of this work i heard a, a cliche but i think it's true it takes 10 years for an individual to change her or his substantive opinion about a key issue 20 years for an institution and 50 years for a society you can get discouraged at the 50 years 
And yet you look back and think, as the United Church started its movement in 1980, we are just about on target. Here we are 41 years later, and we're getting pretty close. We still have work to do, but we have 10 more years to do it before we hit that 50 year pot. At any rate, a little bit of patience will also help. But the key thing is going to be storytelling and story listening. When people actually hear each other's stories. I have a memory when the committee working on the 1984 report was having hearings out at VST for the work on the report. 23 of us pre-affirmed we were gays and lesbians of the United Church of BC. Not an easy word to roll off your tongue. 23 of us took a deep breath and we walked in and came out to this committee, most of whom didn't know, for instance, that I was gay or, well, I could name several others for whom this was a first time step. And it changed the committee. Um, they said, you and you and you and you, my friends, my neighbors, my colleagues, my fellow ministers, you, you can't be gay. You're gay. Oh, so storytelling, story listening is crucial on every one of these issues of difference and the way that we can learn from each other. I think also uh, a lot of discernment of spirit. I would talk about prayer, about silence, about openness, because I am convinced totally and absolutely that the movement of affirmation is spirit driven and spirit, spirit driven and spirit empowered. And if we pay attention and try to discern and listen, then the spirit has got some openness in us to say, okay, how about nudging you around here? Do we have a three hour session this afternoon? I had originally thought of breakout groups or even pausing for questions, but given the time and that we're gonna quit at about 10 to 5 to, I'm gonna press on. And I'm smiling because I can see Marion who once told me at a presbytery meeting, Gary, sometimes you don't have to say everything. Just choose a few things and say it. And I, Mary and I have literally done my best to follow that wisdom, but unsuccessfully. I'm sometimes known as the guy who uses 10 words when one will do and thinks it's a good thing, but you live with me. There are some other things that maybe we get. Um, I want to leave that thought with you about the broader theological implications of how do we live with difference? And that that is the deepest call of the Fermin ministry. And it spreads not only for LGBTQ community, but also in so many other places. And particularly this time when we're wrestling with racism and immigration and refugees, that is so crucial. But I also want to turn to take a look at the Bible because what often discovered in 1988 and the events leading up to it that was most often, it was our different understandings of how we interpret and live with scripture that undergirded so many of our other differences. I mean, I could go on and, and talk about scientific learning. Nobody knows quite what causes gay. Um, it's a wild variety of genetic factors, perhaps hormones in intrauterus. Um, maybe the one thing that's clear, it's not Freudian, a powerful mother, absent dad. It's nothing to do with childhood abuse. It just happens. It's present in all cultures, all throughout all eras of history, at least as behavior, if not lifestyle orientation. But, but you know all that. And so it's really wanting to look at the Bible. And interesting, the good old United Church said, mm, another issue, we better do some more education. So 1992 published another study called The Authority and Interpretation of Scripture by David Lockett. And we all studied that and said, okay, how do we understand scripture? So you can come at it in, in several different ways. One might be to lift up the six passages that seem to talk about homosexuality in the Bible. A number of LGBT folk, including myself, call them the clobber texts. Whenever you're in a discussion with more conservative folk, they bring them out like a club and say, see, it says no. So how can you ever go against the Bible? I could walk you through uh, an interpretation of those six, but there are books written about that. But it's Sodom and Gomorrah, which, interestingly enough, was never mentioned in the Bible as anything to do with homosexuality. It was always the sin of hospitality, which I thought was a little ironic. Or Leviticus, the two passages, chapter 18 and 20, that say it's forbidden. But we very easily get rid of all the clothing and the dietary laws, and just about everything else, out of two chapters and say, but ah, these two verses that condemn male homosexuals, those ones we're keeping, because they're the word of God, the rest isn't. 
you can tell I'm biased. Two little verses from Paul in the list of people who won't inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's Malakoi and Arsenokites, and there's huge debate about what they actually mean. You look at it, sometimes it's prostitute, sometimes it's effeminate, sometimes homosexual, which couldn't have been the term because that didn't get invented as a word until the late 19th century. Um, so lots of debate. And then there is Romans 1, 26 to 27. And just for interest, it's the only one verse in the entire Bible that says anything that, about lesbianism. So, I mean, five, six against gay, one against lesbian. So I'm thinking, hmm, they missed something here. And there are ways of dealing with that, but I'm not going to take up your time walking through each of the texts. But I, I tell you, it's a time to do some biblical work and do that with your parishes or your communities or the groups that you're working with, because people may not know, but they've heard the Bible says no. The other thing you probably need to do is take a look at the whole notion of relationship between individuals within the Bible. And a number of people that I talked to in early years say, you got to know, Gary, it's about Adam and Eve. It's not about Adam and Steve. And I'd say, oh, give me a break. It's actually about a helpmate and someone who will be a companion. It actually doesn't say anything about genitals or sex or intercourse. The next chapter, there is a little sex and produces some babies, but it's clear that reproduction is not the sole or only purpose of sexuality. It's the unit to function to bring us together. And I would say, oh, there is no reason that they have to be opposite genders. They can be the same gender. What the scripture is saying is we humans are made for each other and we need to be in companionship, either as lovers, as family, as friends, as neighbors. We're called to be with each other. And maybe we need to choose one special one and say, with this person, I pledge my life. But the standards are the same, I would argue, regardless of gender. This is the place, though, that I want to become um, literalist, because I have a favorite verse from 2 Samuel, chapter 1, verse 1. This is when Jonathan has been killed in the war and died on the hills of Gibeah, and David just discovers it and offers up this lament and says, Oh, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. And this line, your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. Do you want to take that one literally? I actually get people angry. They say, you're besmirching David's reputation to think that this could be homoerotic or actual physical love. It's not. It's, it's, it's platonic. You're, you're smirching, besmirching friendship, good male bonding. I say, oh. Uh, it says surpassing the love of women. Um, anyhow, I, I won't go on any further, but I will point out that uh, there was a wonderful moment at 1988 General Council when Brian Thorpe got up and said, what are we actually talking about? He said, we're talking about practicing homosexuals, practicing the relationship. He said, I want you to know that a couple of weeks ago, I walked into a hospital room and there were two people that I knew that had been partners for decades, two women, lesbians, lovers, family. One was dying and her partner was holding her hand, praying, comforting, trying to be with her. And I'm telling you, I saw two people practicing a relationship of love and that God was blessing it and smiling upon it. And we need to get away with an obsession with genitalia. We need to talk about friendship, companionship, practicing our relationships of care and of love. And if you're really interested in some background, look up St. Sergius and St. Bacchus, who actually got married. There's actually a script of the promises and vows they made. And James Boswell, a gay historian, found more examples of that. And again, the uproar has been huge, saying, you are besmirching saintly reputations. It was platonic, but it looked very cuddly to me. And, and if you do want to look, um, there is a place where David and Jonathan actually kiss each other. So that, that for me is, is a gift that I don't often see in scripture, but, but there it is. Or the final thing that you need to do really is to take a look at the overarching vision of scripture and, and maybe use a Christological lens that says, this is a faith that moves towards including the marginalized, the oppressed, the ones on the edges, who wants to affirm a kingdom of life for all. 
where there's peace and compassion and justice and joy. And that over, over rides any of these other impulses that we have to, to shrink it down and say it's just ours and not for, for anybody else. Okay, I'm going to take, I, I've got to do one more thing. Because one of the things that has happened to me because of this whole 40 year journey around affirming and LGBT issues is to discover that I'm someone who's emerged as a huge believer in the power of the spirit. Pneumatology might be a, a technical theological word, but that's probably what I meant by prayer and openness and discernment. I am convinced that the spirit visited the United Church in 1988 and after and said, this is the way. Because you need to know that Mary in here chaired a sessional committee that was going to deal with all the reactions towards the 1980 report that was published in, in February. And there were 1,830 petitions from congregations saying, we hate it, kill it, cancel it, no, no, no. True, there were a handful that said yes. So the wisdom of the General Council was that 24 people from across the country with varying theological positions would come a week before and deal with this report. And I gather from conversation that got written down, Marion, that two arrived and said, we support it. Five arrived and said, we are against it. And the others said, well, we're open to talking and listening and seeing what happens. Meanwhile, my spouse, Tim, recognized that there was not an openly gay or lesbian person on the committee, and that wouldn't fly. Imagine a committee of men deciding on the place of women. Decide, imagine a committee of white people deciding on the place and the role of, of people of color or black people in our church. So Howie Mills, our general secretary, and Marion as chair of the committee said, oh, Lord, this is a little tricky, but okay. Tim, you can become a corresponding member and please find a lesbian. And he talked to Alison Rennie and there were two corresponding members, no votes, but they had the capacity to talk. And that committee started with a binder with the 800, 1800 petitions and a Bible and the report. And I remember Tim coming back and saying, oh, this is going to be fun. Something happened in that committee. Something happened. And I don't know what happened. I, I really don't. And that's why I say it's got to be the spirit. Because that committee emerged from being splintered and acrimonious to a place where every single one of them agreed with a rewrite of the report. They were strategic. They put the report to the side and wrote a new one called the Membership Ministry in Human Sexuality. And in that one, they included the phrase, every person, regardless of sexual orientation, is welcome in the church if you believe in Jesus Christ and follow his way. And every member or those who become a member are eligible to be considered for ministry. And all 24 members, 26 members of the committee went up onto the stage of, of council, said, we want to embody physically the consensus, not the vote, the consensus that we have arrived at, that we need to offer this affirmation and this welcome. Well, it was a church setting, so you can't quite say all hell broke loose, but it was the equivalent. And we moved into huge debate and it passed eventually with tears, with struggle, with debate. The debate went to one o'clock in the morning and I've read different accounts. It passed two to one. Some people say three to one. That is, it was not just a, a razor thin vote. Something changed because most of those delegates had been chosen and sent, commissioners rather, because they were instructed to, dis, to disallow the report and they felt something of the spirit and it changed them. I talked to one, a delegate from a town in North Ontario when I was moderator and he said, I went with the back in my congregation and I was gonna kill that report. There was no place for homosexuals in our church in an ordained way. We, we could be nice to them if they just preferably didn't say too much. But he said, I, in the middle of the conference, bounced between the table hosted by a firm and the table hosted by Renewal Fellowship. 
And he said, on the one table, I saw people singing and praying and welcoming and crying. And on the other table, I saw people angry and red faced and upset and, and, and just furious. And I asked myself, where do I think Jesus would be hanging out? And he said, I changed my vote accordingly, which is to say, maybe the test is to watch for the fruits of the spirit. What emerges from this relationship? What emerges from this person's ministry? Is it full of love, patience, kindness? It's what Paul, I mean, Peter based his um, baptism on saying, we see the behavior, we see what's happening. Okay, I am going to stop, but I have one final story because at the end, of that council, an acquaintance, sort of a friend, not really a friend, who was very definitely in the conservative camp. We had not spent any time together during our general council. He came up to me and he said, Gary, I want you to know I'm praying for you. And I said, Jim, um, I want you to take your prayers off my body. I do not need to be changed by God's love or the power of Jesus. He said, oh, no, 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 no. Gary, you get me wrong. All I'm doing is lifting you up to God. I have no idea what should happen, but I think that God does. And we maybe witness that here. And what I ask for in return is that you will pray for me. Not that I'll be changed or lifted up or see the light, just lift me up to God. Could we do that? And I thought, sheesh, that's why I love this church. That's why I'm a spirit believer. And I said, oh, Jim, you bet. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. And maybe we'll figure a way to get through this. It's a small addendum to that. Four or five years later, at an annual meeting of conference, Jim said, hey, got to talk to you. So we popped out for a quick coffee. And he said, I want to thank you. I want to thank the United Church. Because when my son came up to me last year, instead of kicking him out of the house, I said, oh, OK. Well, welcome. Um, how are we going to deal with this? And a couple of years later, we did the same thing. Coffee break at conference. He said, I just wanted you to know I married my son and his partner. And it was a glorious event. And uh, I think if, if those moments don't convince you of spirit, I'm not sure what will. And I could tell you a dozen more. So you'll have to invite me back sometime. But I think I'm going to stop and say I'm open for questions, um, comments, reactions. Um, I know a lot of stuff didn't get covered, but hopefully enough did to give you a sense of why do we wrestle with difference? How do we use the scriptures? And how open are we to the movement of spirit as we engage in the ministry of affirmation? All people, all creatures. Amen. Do you think I should be a preacher? Maybe. <laughs> you should think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Gary. That was uh, phenomenal. Uh, you were on fire. I'm like, I'm so glad this is being recorded because I'm sure so many of us will want to share. We do have some time for questions. Um, we plan to go a little bit over the hour mark. And so if there are any questions, feel free to either unmute yourself or send it into the chat and then we will, we will find you. While we wait for folks who might be thinking about what they want to ask Gary, that really was, you know, it's always powerful to think about, um, you know, what if it had gone differently in 1988? Like I, I, I wouldn't have had a place here, right? And so I think it's really important for, you know, I always say like the best activists have anger in one hand and gratitude in the other because you have to be angry about all the stuff that we do have to change, but gratitude for all the folks that came before me, before us to create a place at the table, right? Mm -hmm. And for us to hopefully continue to pay that forward as yeah. well. It keeps moving. Just a, a little statistic um, that I came across. It was not a decision received happily by everybody, but there was oh, yeah. continuing growing and it was reconsidered in 1990 and it was affirmed again this time by a vote of four to one and that in over all the decades they think that maybe three percent of the united church membership left for that issue only twenty-five thousand people which 
given what we see is happening now anyhow, wasn't a lot. Um, right. I mean, there because there was constantly reaching, like my experience with Jim, can we pray about this? Or can we have time? Time to just get used to it, to live into it, to hear more stories, to rub shoulders. Anyhow, right. You see what happens Absolutely. if you don't ask questions, I start talking again. <laughs> Um, so someone's asking, are we free to share this with our congregations um, totally. and announcements and worship? Yeah, I mean, thank you, Gary, for allowing us to record it and share. I mean, this is the gift of these times. Um, you know, this is a really important piece of our history and a part important piece of our future and the legacy that we want to continue. So um, thank you so much. So Gary, I'll let you take a look at the, the encouragement that you're receiving from folks in the chat. Um, don't see a lot of uh, questions coming in. So yeah, go ahead. Well, then no questions. One, a couple little more stories. One having to do with the need for struggle and patience at the same time. When I was at Ryerson, we moved into debate on same gender marriage. And there was a committee running with it and they were just gung ho and were ready to take the vote and said, we're gonna win 80% on board. I happen to know that there were two or three patriarchs who were really upset. And I said, just could you wait six months? Because I want to do a lot of home visits. And I did a lot of home visits and a lot of conversations with, oh, maybe six or seven key people. And, and talking about my marriage and their marriage and what their fears were. And finally, we delayed the decision for a whole year. And there were some people annoyed and it passed unanimously. It became a non-issue when people felt they weren't being pressured or rushed for time. And there was a chance to be heard um, and, and to explore and to raise their concerns with respect. Um, yeah. So I want change right away. Um, I also know most of us take time. And, and I appreciate that. Yeah, that a reminder that, and we want as many people to to come together and us to all move forward together, right? Um, we do have one question that came in, it's from uh, Tracy, and she's saying that um, she struggles with engaging folks in this vital conversation who say that they wanna speak and have a voice, but then don't show up to speak when given the opportunity. Any encouragement you could offer for me to stay positive? I, I found when I was looking at that situation I just mentioned in Ryerson, those people were not gonna come out to a meeting. Um, they felt too exposed or too personal, or they knew that the majority was a them and they didn't want to stick out. So going to them and having one-on-one -on -one conversations, make it pastoral to say, I know you want to, to raise issues and concerns. Um, maybe this is not the easiest forum uh, to have a after church coffee hour discussion. How about you and I getting together? Or if it is a gay lesbian person wanting to share her or his testimony or a trans person, um, then set that up, make sure it's safe um, and maybe talk with that person to say, here are the safeguards in place. I remember we had uh, uh, at uh, St. Andrews Wesley at a coffee hour, a trans uh, male to female who was working the streets because there were addiction problems as well. And she talked for about 45 minutes to this 50 people in the congregation that needed to know she was safe um, and, and was scared. And we could give that guarantee and put that out. And, and it, people just shifted in the congregation when they heard her story. They were sad. They were caught by the incredible resilience that this person was still alive let alone um so yeah i'm not sure how to encourage the naysayers um if that's what you're talking about to come on out um maybe the best way is to ask them what would feel like a, a safe setting but the one-on-ones or if something in your neighbor troubles you um to jesus you go one-on-one -on -one and then go a small group oh, to somebody else and maybe there's a small group you minister uh, a gay person a lesbian um, or somebody who's also conservative and you have a, a four-way conversation. Don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In, in the comments, uh, someone mentioned that they left with the communi community of concern and came back with a lesbian partner. <laughs> so that's some progress for you. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Oh, 
Um, so we'll do one last question here, Gary. Allison says, do you have suggestions on how to engage congregation members who aren't in favor, but don't make their questions or opinions known to the community so they can be addressed? Mm, I wonder if you could, this is just uh, off the top of my head, but if you had uh, a place for anonymous questions that say the minister received or only the minister knew and, or would say, um, send me your questions. Um, the questions are important. Um, engage in a whole ministry of questions to say, um, you know, the, that uh, standard line that Jesus asked 175 questions in the four gospels and 130 of them were unique. The other 40 were synoptic repeats. He was asked something like 150 questions. He only gave direct answers to three, i.e. we are a community of questions. <laughs> and Jesus was a superb rabbi. You get a question, you ask a question back. Who is my neighbor? Which one of these was neighbor to the other? Good Samaritan. So questions are wonderful. I don't know how you can again encourage people because they don't want to look bigoted, stupid, prejudiced. Um, and it's easy for the woke or the changed to jump on those who aren't. And maybe finally communities need to say goodbye to some people. I'm not, I hate that. I hate that. It happened in both the Ryerson and St. Andrews Wesley when I came as an openly gay minister, people left, um, which just saddened me that, that somehow they felt driven out of their home church because of my arrival. And I just wish they'd hung in and not made such a stand that they couldn't retreat when they discovered, actually, he's, he's an okay guy, as good as bad as some of the others we've had. Right. I discovered yeah. actually that the volunteer receptionist at our office at Ryerson listened in on some of my home conversations with Tim. And then I heard this via the secretary because she raced to the secretary and she said, you know what? He's just like us. They're talking about what they're going to have for dinner and who's buying the groceries. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, talk, about the, talk about the gay agenda. That's Meat right. Loaf again? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it was such a gracious way. Um, yeah. for her to say, oh, of course, once I, I see a person yeah. that, and who's open to hearing my questions um, and not mocking me or putting me down or dismissing me, but maybe praying for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, true. That's true. A lot arrived at St. Andrews Wesley. That's right. Our second well, biggest donor left. That was a concern. <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much, Gary, for sharing this time. I definitely just want to think I can't get more excited about affirming stuff. I am wrong. So thank you for your passion and the history, the ri very rich history that you bring us and all of the time that you put into this really, really thoughtful hour with us. Um, Trina mentioned that both the recordings will be sent out in communications from both regions. And so if you folks are wanting to share it with your communities, please do. And those things will be uh, made available to you. So don't worry about that. And thank you again, folks, for coming. We had an amazing turnout. So we really appreciate that this matters to you too, because it takes all of us. So um, Trina, did you have anything in closing or? You're muted, Trina. Your, your mic's not coming through. That's weird. Okay. Well, thank you everyone uh, for being here, but most especially thank you to Pam and Gary for leading this uh, really important conversation. Um, it's been really, really great to be part of it. And I know that it will be informative for both regions as we take the next steps in this process of considering becoming an affirming region. So thank you very much. I'm sorry to come in at this point. It's a good eye. I lived for seven 